Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on hydrocarbons as fuel. Now, before you watch this video, make sure you're comfortable and confident with um, how to understand and interpret chemical symbols and formulas, um, then how to balance chemical equations, and finally, the stuff on my previous video on hydrocarbons and crude oil. So in this video, we will be looking at the use of hydrocarbons as fuels, especially complete and incomplete combustion. Um, then we'll move on to look at the air pollution and the acid rain that can uh, be formed as a result of burning um, hydrocarbon fuels. And finally, we'll look at the potential use of hydrogen as a fuel that might one day replace hydrocarbons. So let's start by looking at the use of hydrocarbons as fuels. Now hydrocarbons, especially the alkanes, which we met in the previous video, these are um, any compound with the formula CnH2n plus 2. So the you know, the best examples of that are things like methane, which is CH4, um, ethane, which is C2H6, and so on. So those are our alkanes. Now, these make excellent fuels. Now, their properties include that they release a large amount of energy per gram when they burn. We describe them as having a very high energy density. What this means is that from quite a small volume of fuel, you can extract a very large amount of energy, which makes them very, very useful. They typically flow well. Now, that might sound unimportant, but think about the practicalities of burning a fuel. You know, a lot of you um, may have come to school today or um, driven recently in a uh, petrol powered car or a diesel powered bus or something like that. And the fuel in the fuel tank flows easily through the pipes into the engine. And that is a really helpful property. If it, you know, you could never have a bus or a car that ran on solid coal because it doesn't flow well. And the other thing is that they are safe and easy to store. You know, a canister of gas like you might have on a camping stove there will store without leaking for years and years completely safely. And you can just open the valve and light it as and when you want. Um, and it's really very low effort, very safe, very easy. Now, downsides to hydrocarbons as fuels is that overwhelmingly they are produced from crude oil, which is a finite resource. That means we are using it faster than it's being produced. And so at some point, we don't quite know when, um, that supply of hydrocarbons will run out. And the other even bigger problem is that they release carbon dioxide uh, when they're burned, and that is causing climate change, which is the biggest um, collective problem facing not just humans, but all living things on this planet. Complete combustion. Combustion is the scientific word for burning, okay? which is the rapid reaction of a fuel with oxygen such that it produces a flame. Now, we'll see that there are two kinds of combustion. There's complete combustion, which the next couple of slides are about, and then incomplete combustion, which we'll look at after that. Now, with complete combustion, this is combustion in the presence of sufficient oxygen for there to be full oxidation. So if we look at the equation for it, it works something like this. We have a hydrocarbon reacting with oxygen to produce just two products. One of those is carbon dioxide and the second is water. Now, complete combustion produces a flame that is blue and smoke free, like the flame, the, the, you know, the roaring blue Bunsen burner flame that you will have used in uh, lab experiments uh, lots of times by now, I hope. Now, complete combustion releases the maximum amount of energy. And you know that, you know that this roaring blue flame is the hottest flame and that's because the combustion's complete and it's releasing the most energy um, that you can from the fuel. Okay, so what we need to do now is look at how we can produce some balanced symbol equations for the complete combustion of a range of different hydrocarbons. Our first one we'll look at is here, C2H4, which is called ethene. Now, when it is doing complete combustion, that means it's reacting with oxygen, which is O2, and it's going to produce carbon dioxide, which is CO2, and water, which is H2O. Um, we could put some state symbols in if we like. So G for gas over here, G for gas, G for gas, and L for liquid. Okay, now, <clears throat> 
To balance these simple equations, we're going to start by writing out the symbols for each element. So C for carbon, um, H for hydrogen, and O for oxygen. Now let's count them up on each side. We'll do it as a tally chart. So we've got two carbons on the left and only one on the right. We've got four hydrogens on the left, one, two, three, four, and only two on the right, one, two. And then we've got two oxygens on the left, one, two, and one, two, three oxygens on the right. Now, remember to balance equations, we can't change the different numbers because that changes what the um, substances are. So all we can do is change the big numbers, the coefficients in front of each uh, substance. So we've got two carbons on the left and only one on the right. So what we can do is if we put a big two in front of that carbon dioxide, that now means we've got two carbon dioxides, which means two carbons. But it also means two times two to give us four oxygens. So that's another two oxygens to give us a total now of five on the right. Let's move along to look at the hydrogen. Now we've got four hydrogens on the right and only so four hydrogens on the left and only two on the right. So again, we want to have four hydrogens over here. So the way to do that is to put a two in front of H2O because now that means we've got two waters, not just one. That means we've got another two hydrogens, but it also means we've got another oxygen as well. So now we've got a total of six oxygens on the right and still only two on the left. So let's balance up on the left. We've got two oxygens already. We want a total of six to balance out the six on the right. So if we put three here, three times two would give us six oxygens on the right. And now we are all balanced. Let's look at a slightly harder example this time, which is ethane C2H6. Now it looks very similar, but it's going to be a bit harder to balance. So let's go in and put the rest of our um, symbols first of all. So complete combustion. So we'll be having oxygen, which is a gas, and we'll be, at, be reacting to produce carbon dioxide, which is a gas, and water, which is a liquid. Okay, and let's put a G for uh, ethane as well, because that's also a gas. So let's go ahead and balance it like before. So we're going to do our tally chart, C, H, O. Let's get counting. Two carbons left, one right, six hydrogens left, two right, and two oxygens left, three right. So it's starting off very similarly, but what we'll see is it's going to get a little bit more complicated than the last one. Now, let's start by balancing out the carbons. So we've got two left and only one right. So I put a large two in front of my carbon dioxide. That now means I've got two carbon dioxides rather than just one. So that means I've got one more carbon and two more oxygens. So I update those on the tally chart. So carbon's looking all good. Let's try the um, oxygen, not the oxygen, sorry, the hydrogen. I've got six on the left, only two on the right. So I've got two hydrogens in each water. So to get six in total, I will need three waters like that. That will give me six hydrogens on the right and also two more oxygens. Now this is where our balancing could get a little bit tricky but we're going to use a trick that we saw in the balancing symbol equations video. So at this point, I've got seven oxygens on the right and only two on the left. Now, you might want to do this. You might want to say, well, let's put three and a half oxygens because three and a half times two would give me that seven uh, on the left. The trouble is these fractions are often a little bit frowned upon in a balanced equation. In the GCC exam, uh, mark schemes sometimes they allow balanced uh, uh, equations that are balanced with fractions sometimes they don't so if you if you end up with a fraction like this it's absolutely fine because there's now a sneaky little trick that we can use um, what we're going to do is we'll multiply through by the denominator of that fraction so we've got a half there so if we now multiply everything by two so that times two would give us two um, ethanes which would give us another two carbons and another six hydrogens. We can multiply the oxygen by two. So three and a half times two would now be seven oxygens. Um, so now we've got another seven oxygens on top of the seven we already had. 
do the same over on the right as well. So multiply our carbon dioxide by two. We've got two already. Two times two will give us four. So now we've got four carbons and we've got another four oxygens. And do the same with our waters. Um, so we, we've got three already. So we're going to make that six. Um, this will give us another six hydrogens. And another six oxygens as well. Not, not six oxygens. And another three oxygens, sorry. And what you can see there is that now suddenly it all balances. So when you get to that half, multiply everything through by two and you'll find that it all works out just fine. Let's look at our last example then. Our last example is going to be C4H10, um, which is butane. And what we'll see is we're going to need to use our magic balancing trick again, um, where we multiply through by the fraction. So this is just to get that practice in. Now, let's uh, get this done then. So um, butane, C4H10 is a gas. We're reacting with oxygen, so we're going to go O2 in brackets G. And this is complete combustion, so we're making carbon dioxide, CO2, which is a gas, um, and also H2O, which is a liquid. Okay, now let's get balancing. C, H, and O. Let's count carbons on the left. We've got four in the C4H10, and on the right, just the one. Hydrogens on the left, we've got 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And on the right, just two. Um, and then oxygens on the left, we've got two in the O2. And on the right, we've got two from the carbon dioxide plus one from the H2O to give us three in total. So if we start balancing, you can see we've only got four carbons on the left. Uh, we've got four carbons on the left, but only one on the right. So let's put a coefficient of four in front of the carbon dioxide. That will give us a total of four carbons on the right as well. But also it will give us another six um, oxygen. So one, two three, four, five, six. Let's try and get our hydrogens balanced. So we've got 10 on the left, only two on the right. So if we put a coefficient of five in front of the water, five times two will give us 10 hydrogens on the right as well. So let's add those in to our tally charts. Um, but also that gives us another four oxygens. So one, two, three, four. So at this point, we've got 13 oxygens on the right and only two on the left. So we might want to do this. We might want to have six and a half oxygens like that. Now, again, we saw on the previous example, um, sometimes they will, you know, the mark scheme will be happy with you just to, to leave a half like that. Sometimes they might want it without any fractions, in which case we're going to use our trick of multiplying by the denominator of the fraction. So the denominator of the fraction again is two. So I'm going to multiply my uh, butane by two to give me two of those. That means I'm going to have one, two, three, four more carbons and another 10 hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's look at doing that to the oxygen. So I've got um, 13 oxygens, six and a half O2s. So if I multiply by that by two, I'll now end up with 13 O2s. So I'm going to have um, a total of 26 oxygens. Just drawing those in. It's not the best viewing, this is it. There we go. There's my 26 oxygens. Um, let's move over to the right hand side of the equation. So I've got four carbon dioxides. If I double that, I'm going to make the four into eight carbon dioxides. So if I put another four carbons in, one, two, three, four, you can see my carbons on the tally chart now balances. That also means putting another eight oxygens in. So um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And finally, let's uh, balance out my, ox my uh, waters as well. So multiply those by two. That now gives me 10 waters, which means 20 hydrogens. So draw another 10 in. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So now you can see there's 20 ox hydrogens left and right. And finally, there'll be another five oxygens with that as well. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And now that gives me 26 oxygens left and right. So that little doubling trick can really uh, save us a lot of backwards and forwards work to make our balancing a lot easier. 
Okay, so let's look at incomplete combustion. Now, this is combustion with insufficient oxygen for complete combustion. And it produces a much more complicated looking word equation where we still have hydrocarbons and oxygen reacting. But this time, as well as producing carbon dioxide and water, they also produce carbon monoxide and carbon. Okay, now carbon monoxide is just CO and carbon is just C. Now, this produces a flame that is yellowy orange and smoky like this. Most of the flames that you'll see in your day-to-day -day life tend to be incomplete combustion. So that, that orange flame there is producing carbon monoxide. It's also producing carbon. The smoke that you can see here, that is the carbon that's being produced by the incomplete combustion. Now, this produces less energy than a complete combustion flame does. Um, which is a problem and it also um, means that we can't do balanced equations and the reason why is because the exact ratios of each of our four different products depend on the exact amount of oxygen that is present for the combustion now the carbon monoxide that we form is a really big issue and um, carbon monoxide is a colorless odorless and highly toxic gas it actually binds permanently to the hemoglobin in our blood preventing our blood from carrying oxygen. Now, if there's less oxygen in our blood, that reduces the amount of respiration we can do, which reduces the amount of energy we have. You know, And so often what happens is you're, if you've been poisoned with carbon monoxide, by the time you've realized what's happening, you may actually have too little energy to be able to escape and you just drift off to a permanent sleep. Now, for this reason, the gas boilers in a home must be regularly checked to ensure there's a good airflow to prevent um, incomplete combustion taking place, which will prevent carbon monoxide buildup. So if you look um, on the outside of most homes, um, particularly houses rather than flats, uh, they will have um, a pipe that looks like this on the, on, the, uh, on the outside, that's called the flue. And that flue can easily be blocked by say insects building a nest in there, or sometimes even birds building a nest. Um, and that blocks the airflow to the boiler, reducing the amount of oxygen, potentially leading to incomplete combustion and a buildup of carbon monoxide. So what happens is that if you're certainly in a rented accommodation legally, um, a gas engineer has to come around once a year to check the flue and to check the boiler to make sure there's no incomplete combustion that's happening. Um, the other big issue we've got with incomplete combustion is the carbon um, that's being released, which we also call soot. This is a major source of air pollution and lung disease. Tens of thousands of people die in the UK every year as a result of the uh, lung conditions caused by the air pollution from incomplete combustion. Now, let's just compare the two types of combustion. So if we think about complete combustion, when it occurs, it occurs when we've got plentiful oxygen. The products are just carbon dioxide and water, and it produces a blue and smokeless flame. In terms of energy, it releases lots of energy, the maximum amount of energy that is stored in the fuel. Um, and there are no particular health concerns with this. There is the big global warming concern from the carbon dioxide, but there are no direct health concerns. If we look at incomplete combustion, then this happens when there is insufficient oxygen and it produces carbon dioxide and water again, but also carbon uh, monoxide and regular carbon. It produces flames that are yellow, orange and smoky. It releases less energy than incomplete, so than complete combustion. And the exact amount of energy depends on the exact amount of oxygen. The less oxygen there is, the less energy that gets released. And finally, there are these two big health concerns. The carbon monoxide is that toxic gas and the carbon, the soot, um, builds up in the lungs and causes lung disease. Burning hydrocarbons is a major source of air pollution, and one of those types of air pollution is due to the oxides of sulphur. So fossil fuels, and by fossil fuels, we're talking coal, oil, and natural gas, contain sulphur as an impurity. And that's especially true of coal and oil. So if we look at this photo of some coal here, you can see these patches of yellow showing areas where the coal has lots of sulphur and mixed up with all of its carbon atoms. So when we burn those um, fossil fuels containing that sulfur, the impurities, the sulfur also burns 
and when it does so it produces sulfur dioxide according to the following equation so sulfur and oxygen react to make sulfur dioxide or or we could say s plus o2 makes so2 now the sulfur dioxide rises up into the air and it dissolves in water in the clouds and as it does that it reacts to form an acid called called sulfurous acid h2so3 and we can see that happening here you can see the way that we've got these chimneys producing this smoke and as it goes up into the clouds any sulfur dioxide present in those uh, in the fumes from that um, power station there are going to react in the water to form the sulfurous acid the h2so3 and that works like this so sulfur dioxide and water reacts to make sulfurous acid um, so2 plus h2o makes h2so3 now the sulfurous acid rapidly oxidizes to form sulfuric acid h2so4 um, so we can see the sulfurous acid reacting with oxygen to make sulfuric acid so h2so3 plus half an o2 reacting to make h2so4 and that sulfuric acid then that's what falls to the ground as acid rain Another major source of air pollution from burning hydrocarbons is the oxides of nitrogen. Now, importantly, this is not something that comes directly from the hydrocarbons themselves, but from the way that we burn them in internal combustion engines. So one of these uh, oxides is nitrogen monoxide, um, or NO. Now, this is a gas that is produced when nitrogen reacts with oxygen accidentally in the high temperatures that we find in internal combustion engines, especially diesel engines like this bus, because diesel engines run at higher temperatures than the petrol engines do. Now, in that reaction, what happens is N2, the nitrogen, reacts with O2, the oxygen, to form nitrogen monoxide. Now, this is an unwanted and entirely unavoidable reaction it just happens because the oxygen and the nitrogen present in the engine are hot enough to be able to react. Now, some of the nitrogen monoxide then further oxidizes to form nitrogen dioxide, NO2. So two NOs react with another oxygen to make two NO2s. And we collectively refer to these different oxides of nitrogen as NOx or just nitrogen oxides. And these are harmful. The NOx can react with sunlight, or can react rather in sunlight, to form uh, with other substances to form a very harmful sort of smoky fog that we call smog. And we can see that here. So you can often see over very big, very industrial cities this sort of haziness that looks like fog, but it's not. This is smog. Now, smog is very harmful and it causes all sorts of lung and other conditions. Nitrogen dioxide is directly harmful, even without the presence of smog, and can cause lung diseases such as bronchitis. And lastly, the NO2 can dissolve in cloud water to form nitric acid, and therefore is another source of acid rain in addition to the sulfur dioxide that we saw on the previous slide. So we've just seen two different ways that acid rain can be produced. So let's now try and understand the effects of acid rain. Acid rain is any rain with a pH lower than 5.7. So rain is naturally slightly acidic due to dissolved carbon dioxide, but it will be sort of around pH 6, 6.5. So anything lower than pH 5.7, that's at the point where it's not natural and it's due to the effects of dissolved sulfuric acid and nitric acid that have come from burning fossil fuels. Now, it's important to understand that acid rain is typically no lower than pH 4, and it is not acidic enough to be directly harmful to humans. So, you know, if you were caught outside in a shower of acid rain, it would just be like regular rain. You're not going to, you know, your skin's not going to start getting blistered or start falling off or anything. It's, it's not that dramatic. But it does have these long-term and significant effects on both the natural and the built environment, which we need to be aware of. So in terms of the natural environment, acid rain causes essential minerals to wash out of the soil, which can kill plants and trees. 
and we can see that here so what happens is these plant these trees have died because they haven't been able to get the nutrients they need from the soil because the acid rain has washed them out of the soil the low ph in water can damage and kill fish especially their eggs which has major effects on um, aquatic um, habitats and in terms of buildings um, the acid rain can react with the metals and rocks um, that we build our buildings out of, especially things like limestone. Now, this is bad for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it can weaken the buildings. And secondly, it can wash away, it can erode away their fine details. So here we can see a statue, um, a photo of a statue taken about 100 years apart um, before and after long term exposure to acid rain. And you can see all the details of the face. Um, that are really clear there have been eroded away and you might say to yourself well so what what's the big deal it's only a statue but these things are important you know these beautiful buildings that form part of our built environment they're part of our culture part of our history part of who we are and as we lose those we lose something of us so we can see that acid rain is affecting both the natural environment and also the built environment and both impacts are important okay so the last thing to look at is the potential use of hydrogen as a fuel. Now hydrogen has got great potential for use as a fuel and there are two main ways we might use it. We can use it directly in modified car engines in very much the same way that we do with petrol currently. We can also use it in special kinds of batteries called fuel cells. These are batteries which run directly on hydrogen producing electricity very efficiently, much more efficiently than you can produce energy from an engine. And we can see an example of a fuel cell here. The idea is that you put hydrogen in and oxygen comes in the other side and the only waste product produced from it is completely harmless water. And you get a whole load of electricity used which could power electric motors in a car or something else as well. Now, burning hydrogen only produces water as a waste product. So there is no impact whatsoever on global warming. So this really sounds like the perfect fuel. But there is one problem, and it's quite a big problem. Hydrogen is rare. There are not many naturally occurring reserves of hydrogen. So most of it must be made by the electrolysis of water. Now, here's the thing. If the electricity used for that is renewable electricity, we're all good. But if it is non-renewable electricity that has been produced using fossil fuels, there will still be carbon dioxide emissions produced by producing the hydrogen. It's just they're not coming from burning the hydrogen. They're coming from producing electricity to power the electrolysis to make the hydrogen. So we still have this global warming impact. The other big problem we've got is the real lack of infrastructure for the widespread distribution of hydrogen. Think about, you know, Every town and village you go to, there are petrol stations all over the place. And those petrol stations, 99% of them are selling petrol and diesel. And a few of them might be selling natural gas as well. But very, very few of them are selling hydrogen. And so if you had a hydrogen powered car, where would you refuel it? The last issue we've got is that hydrogen is harder to store and work with safely than conventional fuels. So... We can see that hydrogen's got great potential for a few, as, as a fuel, but there are these drawbacks which make it less than perfect right now. But I'm sure these are problems that scientists and engineers will be able to solve uh, in the long run. There we go. That's it. The end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.